Good. Welcome to our March meeting. If everyone would stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Start this evening with a presentation in State of the District by our Transportation Department. Mr. Briscoe. Should be right the tab right at the top. Delaware Academy Trails. And then just hit up at the top right slideshow. It should say, yep, yeah, right there. Slideshow. Hey, good evening. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to bring you up to date on the <laughs> transportation department. Um, let's move on here to what am I doing here? What's that? That's where you got to clap and do a dance. Oh, okay. right. there we go. All right. Okay. Um, as we all know, we have our district goals um, in each department, lining with the district goals. Um, I can read them all, but basically, the presentation is going to align with each of the goals, and I can uh, tie them in as we get going here. Um, the statistics for the 23-24 school year this year for the fleet, uh, right now we currently have 18 yellow school buses. Um, they are leased, five-year lease on um, each of them. As you know, five or nine of them are up this year and then the other nine next year. Out of the 18, they are all identical 44 or 66 passenger buses, standardized, other than one of them is a wheelchair accessible bus for the need as it arises, and occasionally we do meet that. Um, five vans are DOT, uh, registered DOT for student transport, and again, um, currently four of those are being daily used daily on runs. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have is we have a 192 square mile district, pretty large. Uh, geographically, um, different terrain um, doesn't always connect us all over, so the, the runs that we have are mapped out and routed um, to be able to go to these different areas um, with the different uh, things in mind, like the time with students on the bus and so forth. Right now, I feel that um, we have 15 of uh, the daily routes are done with yellow buses, and we're pretty much down to where geographically that's about as minimum as we can get in order to cover all the terrain in the time that would be reasonable for students and on the bus, um, <clears throat> and we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, we have 17 daily routes, like I said, 15 of the yellow buses, two of them with vans. We currently are running uh, one van run to Children's Home Wyoming Conference in Binghamton, and another one does the Outer District and Springbrook run. Um, we run daily uh, two buses to BOCES, which is at the Herald campus, and just recently, as things change, um, we have a placement at the Norwich Pole Campus, so we're running a van there. Um, at any time, occasionally, CSC might have a placement. It can be temporary or otherwise. The county might have a foster placement or remove uh, students in our district and place them outside. That will be our obligation uh, to keep their uh, education consistent to go and get them. And it's, Sometimes it's for a couple of weeks, and we've done it for a year and a half before, where we have to move students and bring them back in. It's ours. That's the same with homeless. If something comes up with a homeless run, um, and if someone gets put out of their house here and, and they go out up to like 50 miles, it's our obligation to bring them back in if that's what it falls under. Um, we're averaging over 1,300 miles a day. Um, our 19A annual statistical report, which is um, compiled and put in so an affidavit of compliance um, every June, um, June 24 for the 23K 
calendar year was 283,000 miles that we're running. And this is up on um, last year, I think it's like 260,000 miles. A lot of that is we're, we're putting more stuff on, especially since coming out of COVID, we've been entered in and doing a couple more trips and things are building back up, plus some of our out of district um, runs. Uh, that's compiled with everything that's our daily runs, sports, uh, and field trips and so forth. That's total mileage for the district. <clears throat> Students transported, we have 752, last I knew, were students, and we have 670 assigned to buses. Some of those that are not are like the teachers that live out of district and or have chosen not to and, and for whatever reason are not at all on the bus. Um, the buses are averaging around 50 students per um, bus as loaded. Um, that may be morning or afternoon, depending. Um, I'll explain that in a minute here. Uh, the morning loads are typically more than the afternoon loads, and that stands for reason. You have clubs and different things going on, and a lot of middle school, high school kids don't ride in the afternoon because of sports and different events going on. Out of the elementary, wait, last statistic I had a couple weeks ago, 338, um, 205 are daily changes. This is what we used to call, or have called, a fringe benefit of Delaware Academy. It's very labor intensive, and it does create a lot. The ladies up in the elementary do a great job, along with Jane. Uh, Ashley does a lot of it. Rhonda, um, we offer, as most districts don't, that students can change and ride different buses each night into different places. Most districts are policies you pick one spot, and that's where it is for the year, and unless it's a major family crisis, we might let you change it once, and then you go from there. Uh, Delaware Academy, we facilitate these changes um, and do very well <coughs> considering these numbers. 205 of them are changed daily out of that 338, 60% um, that is. Um, 80 of those, or 23%, are off the bus, whether they're staying for scrambled legs, girls on the run, or walking to an office or something else. And, um, and then we also have to deal with daily attendance, um, especially for the K or pre-K through five. We keep track of every one of those on our buses. So we need to know where they are and what bus they're on, and we don't leave until we do, and it can account for every one of the students. Now, after that, when they get to sixth grade, they're on their own. I mean, at that point, they're responsible. If they don't show up to the bus on time, the bus leaves, they gotta call home or whatever. Um, and, and I give that speech even to the sixth graders when they're coming in is things have changed. <laughs> you will be there or there's no ride, but we're not looking for them if they don't show up, let's put it that way. Um, but we do keep track of K-5. And um, the big number is there's 125 that are switching, or 37% of that, um, daily to different buses that we're keeping track. And that's not just one switch. That may be a different switch every day of the week and every opposite week, something different. So there's paperwork and there's documentation and parents. And it doesn't go without a glitch sometimes where someone, the student either didn't put the note in or it's in the backpack or the parent forgot and we're checking and calling. Um, assuredly though, the students are safe and they're on our buses and we're taking care of them. If they get out and they got on the wrong bus and we find out that they weren't supposed to be someplace, We'll keep them on the bus, we'll try to make that connection, or we'll bring them back to the elementary at the end and we'll, we'll see that they get dropped off. But the biggest thing when we get a parent panic is they're okay, they're with us, we're not gonna put them someplace where they're not supposed to be. Um, and again, I said that middle school and high school have a lot of variables as far as um, the uh, different things that they stay after. Um, Back to the runs, with what ties in there, so different runs. Um, just briefly, the average of 50. I have some of the buses that might have 30 students on their route, and they're out for a long time and doing that. But in the afternoon, that's the bus that we load with, like Elm Street with Cardio Club and Jiu-Jitsu and so forth, which they have 25 extra kids on that bus for the ride home. This is a lot different than we did years ago. We used to have a village bus run around now. Um, a lot of the runs that are a little bit less, they pick up streets in the village, and which was allowed us to reduce runs and overhead of a bus and a driver and so forth, and we pick them up as they come through. Um, 
Driver shortage, um, there's not a whole lot to say. This hasn't changed a lot. There are a couple things I'm gonna make a point about. Delaware Academy, we're doing okay. We're, we're maintaining. Uh, it seems to be as I have people going out, I have um, people in the wings that are coming in or have talked to me and are considering it. I've always used got somebody um, training and so forth. I have a couple now that are working on it. Um, one of the biggest things um, and issues uh, on top of all the shortages, I was going to bring point to the ELD training, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety um, Administration. They uh, added on a couple years ago that all drivers have early uh, entry level driver training, which is documented training that anybody to get a CDL now has required that they cannot even go and go to a road test unless the Federal Motor Carrier Association has it in their books that they've been trained by certified people and documented. Um, there's three levels of that. Um, one is they have to do theory, which is their books of, of training, which all has to be documented at the home place of training, which can be here and registered for them. Um, you have to have all the paperwork and audit and prove that you did it and testing papers and so forth on file. And then there's also a road and a range that you have to do showing that they've successfully run the courses and did all that um, is required before you can even go to the road test. If that's not satisfied with them, you're not even allowed to go to the road test. And then after that, the road test um, Length, getting a license, um, it depends on the person. I've done it in a month with people that want to work it right off and my timing and so forth last summer. Um, or if they've had some prior training, uh, usually it's a little bit more three to four months because we're satisfying all these, all these entities. Um, we are maintaining and averaging, um, uh, making adjustments where we can. Uh, to, that's the all the agencies tying together with goals that we're working with. Um, all the vehicles are uh, with DOT. Um, one of the things I would point out, uh, the 19A driver records audit just recently, got last week, got the notice. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, got the notice that we're in. It's a whole new thing. You have to put in all the documents and so forth. We got audited on all of our 19A paperwork, driver's records, and so forth. Um, last week, I got the uh, email saying found acceptable, so which is good, um, it's very good. I found the different schools don't always get that, um, so all of our records are in good shape for them, and that is a three-year thing, so just timely that um, I can share that. Um, as a 19 examiner, a certified examiner, I have to keep getting recertified. Uh, we're subject to audits now from. New York State Ed. Um, they have a new uh, program that they call SharePoint. It's for all the documentation where they've been, where we've been the last year, it's gone into effect where you have to gather and look and find all the dates and all the records and everything. We have clear back to the beginning of every driver and what's going on and um, have it all documented. And they have the SharePoint where you download that and then all the new documents they want copies of as you're doing them, you have to share to them and so forth, so in a way they're, doc they're auditing you as they do it. Um, one more thing that's been added to the job along with the LDT. Um, the monitor, um, uh, they're continuing monitoring the training of, as an SPDI, school bus driver instructor, I have to get annually recertified to keep my credentials. And then um, all the drivers still have um, two two-hour mandated refreshers that they have to do along with anything else that they come up with. Um, Federal Motor Carrier, we just talked about that. One of the other things that their major have done in the last couple of years is drug and alcohol clearinghouse. Um, annually, I have to go and submit all the drivers' names and numbers and all for a query to see if there's any activity in that. In a nutshell, what that is is anybody with a CDL now, they cannot um, jump from employer to employer without checking with the clearinghouse because any activity in that area, drug and alcohol, will get reported in. So if there's a, a refused test or a negative test or something like that, it's all documented. So likewise, I have to go and query all the drivers 
and when I get a new driver, enter them in and do it. Um, and we talk about the, you know, the future, the big thing, electric vehicles on the horizon. Uh, New York's 2022-23 budget set a mandate requiring all new buses sold in the state to be zero emission by 2027 and all buses on the road to be zero emission by 2035. Um, there, there are a lot, a lot of concerns with this. Um, obviously, you know, there's different talks about it, different areas of um, concern, especially in the rural applications. Uh, we've talked about the different um, sizes and uh, and the length of uh, service, especially as big as our geographical area, 192 square miles. Um, we're talking about uh, the climate of being cold, cold weather, and the distance that they can travel. Um, we've been doing studies right along that they've been uh, requiring us to do, to do surveys and find out where, as of like right now, of our 18 buses in order to cover our district, if you like, you'd have to have 21 buses. because. One of the concerns is, is that you don't have enough energy in any one bus to do the next trip, so you have to take a fresh bus. So you'd have to have more of them in order to get the job done, and that's part of what they're saying is that some of the concerns. You know, are the buses that we're looking at now are 170,000? It's 400,000 for an electric bus. They're looking at um, they want them to go 10 to 12 years, and um, and. We're you know, not even sure about the leasing and everything else. We all know that around seven years we've been through this song with um, the life cycle in New York State. We have a problem past seven years on that. Um, the batteries, they're saying nine, ten years. Well, what, what are we going to do about that? You know, um, there's many questions around this. Um, we definitely have different groups who are working on it. They are coming up with different results. New things are happening every day. Um, one of the one of the things that Carrie and I have talked about is there's grants coming out all the time. You know, I was very excited about when we were doing the building project and the capital project and we saw the bus drivers. What do we need to do to make sure we're prepared for this? But a lot of the, <coughs> the gurus out there are saying there's other monies for this and there's other things, so don't spend it here. The other thing we look at is if you spend money from one account or from somebody, or if you go in for a grant today, you may not be eligible for something tomorrow, which may be better. So these are all concerns that we're weighing. We're in a good position as far as um, not being the first ones out of the gate doing this. We're seeing different issues with some of the schools are doing. Some of it's been very successful, especially with their shorter runs. Um, one of the things with ours is, um, because we, we're turning our fleet over in the next two years, we'll have five years from this year before you'll be obligated to do anything or have to buy something. So there'll be time to see what's happening out there and where, where it's lining up. And so you'll get past some of these deadlines, the first deadline anyway, to see where it's going and where it's going to be pushed and what improvements have been made. Um, <clears throat> we're, uh, you know, we're looking at the, the changes in what's got to be done in the future. Um, and Carrie can probably speak more to the, the different webinars and different things and studies we've done already. Yeah, I've probably been at about 12 different yeah. webinars, meetings, conferences regarding this in the last year. And I'll be honest, this is probably one of the one one of the items that I I don't feel like jumping headfirst into. And I'll tell you for multiple reasons. Most districts that our size or local districts that are talking about electric buses, there's only two districts that have bought one bus. Uh, we met with a panel about a year ago in uh, Saratoga. We talked to the bus manufacturers. They're pumping out one manufacturer's pumping out maybe a thousand buses. The number I heard was that when they go full electric, they need 50,000. Now, there's only about three manufacturers in the state. So if they're only pumping out about 500 to maybe 1,000 buses a year, they're not going to keep up with it. Plus, the technology is changing rapidly. One of the biggest concerns we had going into this, just like anyone else, is do we even have the power 
from the local agencies to even do this. We are being reassured that we do have that. What we would end up having to do is put a transformer at the corner of Sheldon. So it comes off the line, transformers, then goes through that transformer conduit underneath the driveway and then into the bus garage. The question comes down to who pays for that? Now, Dicey will pay for it if it's residential. I don't know about a school district. So we're, start, we're starting to figure that out also. But to be honest, we're waiting to see, like Greg was saying, kind of see how the technology transforms. Hopefully, I'm hopeful that the state will back off a little bit with the, the mandate that they're kind of pushing right now. Because like Greg was saying, there are grants out there, there are areas where you can grab money from whether it be the state funded or NYSERDA has got a little bit of funding that gives uh, districts, but it's not a lot. $400,000 bus, you get a one time shot at a $395,000 uh, contribution from this. That's it. So everything else is on the district. Again, we don't know timing. If they're looking at now funding bus, so you purchase a bus for $400,000, they'll pay you back over 15 years. That's state. Now they pay us over five years. So if a bus after eight years is rusted, once the frame rusts, we're done, bus is off, and now we're paying for this and getting eight on at the same time, but we don't have the bus. So we ended up, and I don't know if the money came from NYSERDA or it came from the state, but what they wanted to do because of this initiative, they said, fine, we'll give money to the individual uh, energy companies like NYSIG, and we'll let the, we'll pay them to do studies for each individual individual district. So I think we started in August, mm -hmm. and it was about a six month ordeal. Build out paperwork. I would say about three quarters of it was how great electric cars are, how great electric. I, I get it, but it doesn't. The, the report that came out of it was a company called Clear Result. They kind of came in one day, looked at our facility, looked at how many buses we had, where we could put charging stations inside the bus garage, outside the bus garage. But they never looked at anything like elevation. They never looked at, okay, well, what are the, what's the average temp here um, in, a, in a given year? Not, don't take this year, but in a normal year, that's not taken into account. You know? So they came up with a report saying that a bus capacity, the battery capacity is like 220. It's 125 miles. Right, 220 max volts or whatever. Right. But we need 216 for the day. Well, what happens? So Greg and I have bounced a million ideas off each other. Let's say we have a bus run, and all of a sudden we have to do an early dismissal. Good luck. And that's Buses aren't that's charged yet. Yeah. Degrees, yeah. degrees. You know, you've got. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, the other issue along with that is okay. All the buses come in, and we need them charged, and they get parked, and it might even be June or something, and you have a storm come through at 10 o'clock at night and electric goes out, right. yeah. and it doesn't get restored until 2 or 3 o'clock, no, you didn't you charge buses, you're done. They cannot go out because they're not fully charged. How do you do like sports trips? That it, that's that's, that's another charge. issue because if they're used on the local run, that's what they're talking, you may have to buy extra buses just to go out to that further place because Even our so corridor is all the way out. Fully charged, I mean some of these places we go. I just went to think it's some of them. Back. Some of them would not even make it there and back. Right. The so you have to charge it somewhere. If you can and quick that. enough but during that two-hour game, okay. and you see that these are all issues that are being brought to the state. And there's a lot of there's a lot of um, political stuff going on. There's different groups that are fighting it, um, you know, for whatever reason. But these are statistics that when this all came out, even our own groups and and NIAF and different are saying, okay, but. Let us sit down at the table with you and tell you just what you're saying. About how are we doing this? How are you going to do it? Have you considered this? And we're bringing all these things up saying, you, you, you've got this mandate. You've got to bridge, bridge it someplace here. <laughs> and, and throwing it back into their, okay, we're, we're listening. The other, the other big thing it comes back to funding. Which pocket are you taking out of? And especially today with the different things coming on with academics and cutting back is now you're mandating state loans and taxpayers one way or another to to fulfill this bill. And and where is it coming from and how much more, where is that going to rob into academics and so forth where you're going to start because it's going to be the district's responsibility. I think so, a big thing too is it's not, we're not just talking buying buses, you're talking about infrastructure. Right. So the infrastructure alone, charging stations alone, just the number they kind of threw around to us 
was in the vicinity of about six hundred thousand dollars. So it you're just talking charging stations. Infrastructure has to be changed over a little bit too. So it becomes quite expensive. You know, I just this is on the radar. We talk about it probably every week here in this building at some point, or there's some kind of meeting to go to, or a webinar, or I'm in a business officials meeting, and it comes up, and everyone gets angry. Um, but I, I don't think it's something that we have to jump into right away. Keep it on the radar. See what the state's going to do. At the same time, see where technology goes too. Um, you know, so there's a lot of moving parts here. Kelly and I talked about it today. We didn't want to get too deep into it, only the fact that there's so many unknowns that we don't know about it. You could go down many rabbit holes as, as you've been tempted to do just in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the reality is every advocacy group, uh, including our legislators, right. are have, have reconsidered a lot of this. While the governor is remaining firm on the overall long shot timeline, there is much more variability in how we get there. So, for example, perhaps districts will only be required to just purchase one bus to show a good faith effort toward this uh, in order to test it out and see what complications they run into so that we can learn and grow from this process as opposed to jumping in with two feet and, and then regretting. There's also a lot of conversation on aid structures. Um, within both foundation aid formulas, expense-based aid formulas, overall uh, school aid formulas um, that in addition to the grants could be reimbursable in the following year, similar to other aid structures that we currently have. So there are a lot of different conversations that are being held right now, which of course create even more questions, but the learning from that is it reinforces the fact that we will take our time and we'll move into this in, a, in an informed way, um, but also planable for, for the years out. Greg made a great point at the beginning that you know we on our five-year leases, right? We won't even be required to, to look into taking the next step until we're through this next lease that we're just signing. So the baby steps, we'll have to... yep. The baby steps that we've taken so far have been good ones to help us pave the way and make informed decisions around this. But I ask Greg to include this to at least just make the board aware, not only of the work we've been doing, but of, of really where we're going to be heading with this. And in all good faith initially, we talked about, Kelly and I were even talking about earlier today, you know, if they come up with maybe a hybrid situation or something like that, where that would close that gap, so you would be stuck someplace, you could continue on, but you would be able to utilize as much as you could out of that resource. Um, one of the things we are looking at, too, is in, in purchasing of the vans is to go hybrid and see and work towards that goal, because that it doesn't lock you out, you can still use it, but at the same time, you are working towards this goal. Questions? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Aside from the electric bus issue, um, what I one of my greatest takeaways from Greg's annual presentation is just the stark reminder of the above and beyond that our transportation does for our students, for our families in Delhi. Um, we also fund a part-time position to support all of those daily changes so that it does not place additional burden on our families. That's something that this district is committed to, that this board is committed to, um, but it does not fall on deaf ears <laughs> you know, when we see truly the, um, the amount of work that goes into that. I'm not recommending that we change that. It's just, um, it's always a nice reminder. I, 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 the bus drivers and the bus thing, uh, transportation in our district is amazing. I've worked in other districts. It's, I, it's, it's, it's great. They all, the bus drivers are just all very caring people who really take their job seriously looking out for our children and are happy that they're getting on the bus with them in the morning. And it, it really, it, they're like that, it's wonderful. We, we have the best. I, I, I agree. Just came from, I'm sorry that I didn't say I meant to say yeah. that. Yeah, I agree. We have the best, and truly, I am very proud to say that, um, you know, I 
to the supervisor for this group of people. Yeah, and, I, I uh, agree. That, that amazes me daily, different tasks and different things and the stories. And just like that, the story from different parents yeah. that are coming in, yeah. they truly do care and, um, and are good at what it, it, And it shows. That you, you see it. It's, it's great, yeah. Good One job. other thing I do, uh, so kudos to how the drivers are either trained or what you're telling them or what they do, is when our buses go somewhere, they're always clean, and that's on trips, and I'm always, I just think it's a nice, um, best foot forward kind of thing to show up in something that looks decent. I know a lot of the dirt roads we have make it so when they get back from a daily run, they're destroyed like all of our cars are, but I never see our buses out on the road that look like something we're not proud of, so I, I do appreciate that. I see them washing them before the trips too when they pull up, pick up kids, it makes a difference. Move on to public comments. The Board of Education believes that open communication with our parents, students, teachers, personnel, and district residents is very important. For this reason, the board sets aside time at the beginning and end of each regular meeting for public comments. However, in order to focus on tonight's previously scheduled agenda, as a general rule, the board will not be able to respond to your comments and questions at this time. You may refer your comments and questions to the administration for follow-up, or we may add the subject of your comments to the agenda of a future meeting. Either way, please be assured that we welcome and take your comments very seriously. The board asks each person to limit comments to not more than two minutes in order for the district clerk to maintain accurate records of the meeting. Each individual is requested to state his or her name and address. Do we have any public comments? Uh, to routine matters. <laughs> <laughs> public comment is we did not plan this. Yeah, the other <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> fun. Okay, I went to learn the building and went, oh, beautiful. <laughs> we need a picture before you leave. <laughs> Tomorrow's a <laughs> day. <laughs> You're just getting ready. <laughs> hey. Motion, please, to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held on February 26, 2024. <coughs> so moved. Lucy, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion is carried. Taking motion, please, to approve personnel recommendations from Hall. To Crandall. Let's oh, build up the little page four. So I'm okay. Thank you. In a second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? We have several comments. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you're about to approve several retirements in the district and a new appointment. So I just want to take a minute. Um, Deb has some comments from our building principals recognizing uh, the retirements who we have this year. Um, Deb, you want to come sure. up and share? Uh, first is Darlene Crandall, and she is one of the aides in the district. So Julie provided some notes for me. Um, Darlene, one of the most dependable employees at Delaware Academy, whether it is her riding the bus road at 5 45 a.m or working all day with students or her bus ride in the afternoons that get her back to the district at approximately 4 p.m you can count on darlene to be there she is soft-spoken compassionate and gentle she holds the students to a higher standard and the kids she works with try to meet that standard the students know they can count on darlene to have her back and to listen to them without doubt we will miss darlene next year Congratulations to her on her retirement. It is well deserved. <laughs> um, want to uh, Greg? Why don't you jump up with your two drivers, please? I do. I have speaking Diane, of them, great drivers. Diane Maxwell, who's got 29 <clears throat> plus years in the district and has been um, driving everything from sports runs to field trips and. One of my New York City drivers who's taken that on. Um, 
willing to do anything. And then at, at the same time, the last few years, she has also been our OCS driver, the morning OCS driver. So she's concluding this year as a um, regular running at OCS driver. Uh, and then we have Sharon Jadis, who's got 18 years um, in the district. And she also is um, the afternoon OCS driver. So that we're replacing both of them this next year. And um, she has been very successful. And again, both ladies are very well loved by the parents. And I constantly get uh, comments on it and all how wonderful Miss Jay is or Mrs. Maxwell. Back to the middle school. Sure. Um, so uh, Jane Rosner is retiring. Uh, she is math seven. Uh, when I think of the Delaware Academy Middle School, Janine Rosner is the person that I think of. Um, Janine will have put 33 years here at DA, along with completing her student teaching here too. Um, and I remember when I started my educational career way back in the day, I actually subbed for Janine. Um, she is a no-nonsense teacher who gets results. Uh, this past year, she had 79% of students score proficient on the New York State math exam, which means that she had 79% of her students score a level three or four, which is amazing. Um, this is not only one of the best stats in the region, it is one of the best stats for the state. Um, and these are consistent scores over the years. Um, she not only has affected thousands of students, but she is also a great peer mentor for her <coughs> colleagues along with me falling, falling in that category. Uh, Janine was one of my go-to people as a new administrator last year, and I was extremely grateful for her honesty and straight talk, especially when I needed it. Um, I want to thank her for her dedication, passion, and commitment to, to excellence. Um, she will be greatly missed next year, and I wish her the best in retirement. Our last two are here with us tonight. Uh, we have two retirements at the high school. Doug's yes. going to stay standing. Uh, we'll take them right in order. Um, Ms. McGrath, Doreen's right here. So Ms. Trask um, has provided me some words. Uh, Doreen was appointed as a high school social studies teacher on June 18th of 2007 and received tenure on June 21st of 2010. She joined teaching as a second career after having been inspired to go to school for teaching while working as an LTA. She was a significant part of DA's WINGS program, has served as a class advisor, and coordinated foreign travel for students through the EFT travel program. Doreen's approach to teaching is grounded in relationships and creative approaches to bringing the world outside into the classroom. Congratulations on retirement, it's well deserved. And uh, hiding behind the desk, but ever present. Don't think we forgot about you, Mr. Rolfe. <laughs> so Mr. Rolfe was appointed September 21st of 1992 as a high school art teacher and received tenure on April 24th, 1995. Through his time in the district, Brian has served as a coach, class advisor, art club advisor, chaperone, mentor, and union co-president. Brian's level-headed, low-stress approach to situations is much appreciated by his students, fellow teachers, and administration. <laughs> Brian's passion for art transfers to our students as he allows the freedom of expression and exploration within the boundaries of their assignments. His teaching style is one that tasks students with continually reflecting and improving, as demonstrated by the finished works of art displayed in the lobby. Congratulations on retirement. You will be missed next year. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really uh, stressing about filling these positions. It's, it's hard to follow legends. Uh, speaking of filling positions, however, you all know that we've had the technology position open um, for about a year. We've um, explored a number of different candidates, really looking for a great fit. And then one day, Molly Sherman darkens my doorway and says, hey, would you ever consider me uh, for this position? So we sat down and chatted. She went through an interview process. 
Molly is well known to us, um, having student taught here and volunteered numerous hours in her mom's classroom. Uh, she's been teaching last year and a half at neighboring Hancock as a family consumer sciences teacher, which was her uh, first teaching certificate. She also, uh, for her time teaching computer science at Hancock, uh, qualified there for the Statement of Continued Eligibility, which is an extension to a certification, and is pursuing her master's degree, which will further her certification in career and technical education. So when we talk about unicorns uh, and having a little bit of everything, um, she kind of brought this, this package, so I'm, I'm glad that we had to wait this long to come out. Uh, the, the other piece is she is hungry and eager to learn. She's looking forward to, um, to, to training in a lot of the technical coursework that we have visioned and that we've imagined in the development of our Agriculture and Technology Innovation Lab. Um, she's excited to jump right in, work as a team alongside um, our other teacher in the agriculture area, and it will be a nice compliment. So the district is going to support her and continue to work on achieving uh, the additional necessary certifications will really just expand our opportunities for students at DA. So Molly is here tonight, dressed just like uh, the other Ms. Sherman, uh, right down to the buttons on the top and everything. That's amazing. So welcome, Molly. <laughs> Special Education Report from the Director of Special Education for the period February 23rd, 2024 through March 22nd, 2024, as submitted. So moved. Thank you. A second? Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Been a lot of happenings in all three buildings. Um, for student enrollment, uh, there was no changes in the elementary and high school, but in the middle school, we had one entry, a seventh grade student from South Corcoran, and two exits, a sixth grader and a seventh grader both to homeschool. Uh, student successes at the elementary school. FCCLA, spearheaded by Lily McGonigal, brought up 18 book totes to our pre-K room and each student was given a tote, a blanket, and a book, and they can sit in the, they can sit in the totes to read. Is that correct? Am I reading that correct? They're, they're boats. Boats. They're what? They're book boats. They're book boats. Okay. Oh, that sounds cute. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I had to sponsor one. It was super cool. Oh, they, nice. they, they, they are decorated to look like boats in the water. And you got, I got to name my boat. I named oh. it the SS Willow after my puppy. Oh. <laughs> but they are adorable. And this was a service project. Um, and pre-K is benefiting from them and having a really fun place. So they stay there in the classroom? Be. Yeah. Like a gift to them? Yes. Oh, that's so oh, great. That's great. That's yeah. great. Really, really cool. Uh, yeah. there's a, there, there are pictures of it on our Facebook page if you have a chance to look it up. A group of FFA, FFA students met with Crystal and Julie to discuss an idea for an Ag Day. Um, we are in the very initial stages of planning, but this group of high school students had many great ideas and we look forward to bringing them to fruition. Uh, the high school students will be putting on the day for the elementary students. Uh, Mrs. Buell hosted an African drummer dancer sponsored by Wide for All Students, pre-K to fifth grade. Jordan Taylor Hill presented three shows on Friday, um, this past Friday, and the students seemed to love these interactive presentations. Ms. Wilcox, first grade, made a trip to Mr. Lehman's lab. Mr. Lehman used melted crayons to show the kids how different rocks are formed. Uh, this was a culmination of information they had been learning in their reading series. First grade students built many a leprechaun trap. Um, unfortunately, they did not catch one this year, uh, but the traps were awesome. Uh, Janine Osbin presented for our second graders reading uh, and forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, but it's now Ruz, a Persian New Year. Um, and third grade students and their families created some amazing solar systems. In addition, our third grader, third grade students are becoming very adept at writing and supporting their ideals with details from their stories. For the middle school, um, the middle school high school, FCCLA, had 13 students travel to Calicoon to participate in a leadership conference. Uh, this past, was it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Um, two middle school students completed their year-long training as junior leaders. Uh, students competed in star events, and they brought home two golds, three silvers, and one bronze. And five students will attend the national conference uh, June 28th through July 4th in Seattle, Washington. Um, and we had two high school students were elected New York State officers. <clears throat> Um, and I just want to give a big shout out to Mrs. Sherman and say thank you for providing that opportunity for them. <laughs> um, our middle school, high school, all county music festival was held on March 15th and 16th in Walton. Um, students participated in band, jazz band, and chorus. And again, I want to say thank you to Ms. Gibson, Ms. Lindner, and Ms. Collison for preparing our students. Um, the middle school also had eighth grade parent night, which was sponsored by the high school counselors, uh, Ms. Kane and Mr. Chase. Topics discussed were transitioning to the high school, uh, high school requirements and expectations. Parents also had the opportunity to sign up for individual meetings. Um, and in our high school, the musical You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown last month was an excellent production and showcased the talents of our students. Congratulations to all involved in making the production a success. Uh, the high school also has sources of strength. Um, this week is running a spirit week uh, that aligns with the SOS wheel, um, which is mental health, family support, positive friends, mentors, healthy activities, generosity, spirituality, and physical health. And you're right on target with a twin day for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and spring sports have begun. For the faculty and staff, um, we had our staff development recently. Um, in the morning, all staff participated in a workplace violence training um, and also participated in a MITS and IT training. For the afternoon, the elementary school uh, chose to look at data and they were to pick two to three goals in ELA and math and focus on them uh, for the remainder of the year. Uh, the data was shared across the elementary school um, so that everyone was aware of what they were doing. Uh, Julie and Kelly represented the DA admin team um, in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, special thank you to the buildings and grounds guys who put the float together. For the middle school, uh, the staff development in the afternoon, teachers discussed data from their beginning of the year and mid-year benchmarks. Uh, they were tasked with looking at strengths, weaknesses, and trends. Um, and then they were discussing 
how they could support students, um, how they could support students more, adjust their instruction based on the data, um, and they also had time to meet in their departments to discuss vertical alignment. Uh, for the high school, they, um, they looked at region's data within the region. They, they also completed a self-assessment of the New York State Ed SEL benchmarks, that's social emotional learning benchmarks, um, and they are using this uh, for a springboard for future work in this area. Um, and then teachers also were able to meet in their department and grade levels for the afternoon. Um, also, our teachers are participating in professional development in the next gen learning standards in their content areas um, in preparation for standard shifts. Um, and lastly, coming up on our calendars, uh, the elementary school will be testing New York State ELA testing April 11th through the 18th. Uh, the middle school will be testing April 10th through, through the 16th. Um, the end of the quarter is April 19th. Um, the middle school has a dance coming up on April 12th. High school has the high school pops concert on the 26th. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. And then there's also a middle school high school art show at 7 p.m. And April 8th, modified spring sports begin. And April 10th is our Delaware County Counselors Association College Fair for Juniors in Binghamton. Deb, could you clarify, you mentioned the dates uh, for the New York State assessments. Mm -hmm. I want to clarify, the kids are not testing on every single day. No. That those are windows, correct? Those are windows of assessment. So this year the state changed it up and they said, we're gonna give you a window from April 8th until May 20th. And you can test at any point during that time. So our students, uh, sixth grade will test for two days, seventh grade two days, and eighth grade two days. So that window that I just said is sixth, seventh, and eighth grade testing on those dates. Even, even on those days, they're not testing for the full day. No, no, the test is untimed. Uh, but typically it takes an hour and a half. Um, they recommend about an hour and a half for testing time. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Departmental reports. So I want to take some time tonight to uh, go over the budget. That's basically all I've been doing, to be honest. It seems like uh, I will say, uh, I real quick departmental grounds, the uh, building grounds have had plenty of time actually with this weather to work outside. We're working on some of the fields in the Legion, getting them ready for uh, spring sports. We're working with IT on the mid service. We had planned on going. It was, going to be, it was live on April 1st, right? I think we were setting that, it was that right after the break. Mm -hmm. We were gonna transfer everything over, uh, I think it would've been the 9th of April. We decided to kind of pull back on that. Uh, we ended up speaking with the staff at the staff development day. And we are now gonna go for the transfer over to MITS on July. It'll start around the 15th of July and really start on the 19th. So that gives us a little bit more breathing room to work around some of the things, getting all the, the files and data transferred over. So, uh, so Kelly, two weeks ago, uh, presented the budget for me. I appreciate that. Thank you for some time. I was uh, in Albany with my son, and I literally sat. You know it's pretty bad when your bedtime reminder goes on <laughs> your phone at 9.45, and I'm like, what am I doing here? But uh, I appreciate the time. So. But when she presented the budget, we were still working. There were still some kinks that we were working out. I think when she presented it last time, we were at about a 4.7% increase budget to budget. Uh, I got back the next day, the next two days, kind of dug in, looking at a little bit more truer costs on some items, a little bit more on staffing. We we're able to get that down to about 4.3% right now. The only thing I don't have yet for this in this budget is the fuel bids. They have not gone out yet. It's not our fault. We go through BOCES to do our fuel bids. Uh, they are literally waiting to see if the market will drop a little bit. 
If you paid attention, to, it's not. So it's slowly creeping up. I was listening yesterday, I think, in the news, or, or was it last Friday? And I'm kind of saying, let's just go, let's get it over with, because I don't know if it's going to drop at all at this point. As we approach spring and summer, those prices usually go up because of travel. Mm -hmm. So right now we're about a 4.3% budget to budget, which equates to about 937,000. And we're still just sitting at a 2% tax levy as far as just tentative. That's what we have kind of on the books. Again, our tax cap is about 2.09. Remember the original, we are seeing a reduction in state aid of about 370,000. Everyone's seeing some pretty good sized cuts. We've got a pretty good sized cut going forward. Uh, things that are increasing our, uh, the, our budget this year, a lot has to do with some BOCE services. Their costs go up, therefore we absorb those costs. Now mind you, as those costs go up, we get more aid on it, but that aid doesn't flow until the following year. The mid-service, like I said earlier, is a little more pricier, better service, much more, I would say, detailed, but it does increase. We will see that aid flow the year after. CTE tuition, we were talking about uh, methodology or, or units of methodology or, or the way they cost things out of BOCES. They do a three-year average for CTE. It's the only thing they do a three-year average. So they look at tuition. You can have a really good year. You can have a really bad year. We've had, we've seen an increase. We've seen. I think when I started here, we saw about twenty to twenty-four students that attended the CTE program. <clears throat> Last year, we were up around thirty-five. So kids are taking advantage of that. Again, those costs go up and increase that three-year average. Greg and I were talking about bus leases. I think when I started here, it was about one hundred forty-five thousand for a bus. One hundred fifty. Now it's one seventy. To 130, 130 <laughs> even better. Uh, so we have a lease coming up in July. It's nine buses, and then we'll have another lease that'll come up next July, a year for a year and a half from now. So, um, and then special ed placements, we're seeing a very big increase in that, and we're not the only district that's seeing that. Districts all around are seeing it too. The issue too is that you have. DCMO has programs, ONC has programs, but they run into staffing problems also. So they either can't, they don't have any slots available, they don't have staff to do it. So we seem to be going further out for some of these placements. We've looked at even Cobalt Skill for a few. And that, of course, then includes travel. So salary, supplies, materials, contractual increases, those are all normal. That happens every year. So with the 2%, so let's we'll talk about real quick. Kelly and I had a conversation, she was in Saratoga. Was it last week? Mm -hmm. There is some, I would say, optimism that aid will be restored. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you speak on behalf of that, sure. what you learned on that, yeah. too. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm going to put you on the spot. Let's go. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, we, we've been hearing from representatives of the State Education Department um, and from our local uh, senator and assemblyman that based on the passing of both one house budgets that there is great confidence <coughs> that foundation aid will be restored uh, in this year now it's not a guarantee until the executive budget comes out but um, everybody seems to be of the of the mindset and fairly confident that we'll see restoration in this one year part of that is to buy time uh, for two things to buy time to re-examine the foundation aid formula meaning that the state will continue to look at safe harmless and slowly transitioning away from that from safe harmless in the way that it traditionally calculated um, and the other is to buy time for districts to if they haven't already engage in long-term financial planning uh, and plans to sustain the future of their districts in a number of different models so while we can um, optimistically count on uh, restoration, potentially full restoration at this point, for the long term, I would encourage us to, again, continue to keep an eye on the long game. Uh, because while we may see that in year one, <coughs> year two, or three, and several years out, we cannot necessarily count on that. So I talk about tax cap real quick. And we are at a 2.09. We're, again, put, building a budget at a 2%. I presented this, I think, it was probably six months ago, maybe a year ago at this time. 
talking about tax cap, where we've gone, where we've been at tax cap, what we've put, to, put forward as far as for voters, and then we talk about what is being left on the table. And those are kind of key talking points that I've been part of some, kind of like some seminars and webinars and things like that. Uh, when you don't go to cap, what happens? Well, of course, you have the ability to raise so much money, but you raise less than that. So looking at a 2.09% tax cap and at a 2% tax levy, we're only leaving about $9,000 on the table. With that, we did an analysis all the way from 2018 to tentatively this coming year's budget, and that leaves about, we've left about a little over half a million on the table. When I say that, it's because a lot of times they say, <coughs> by leaving that money on the table, now you'd have less of that to work with when budgets go south, when we, we see aid reductions and things like that. Now, we've been very good, too, as far as reserves, and I consistently talk about that. But then again, when you get into a situation where you're seeing that budget go south, districts have not raised enough money to support their program because they keep pushing forward. Now, Carrie, is that just a straight calculation with various percentages, or does that take into account when you look at and calculate the tax cap in the subsequent year, mm -hmm. you're now basing that on a reduced number right. out of the gate, exactly. which has implications for pilots, implications for you know all the other factors that go into calculating tax cap. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that, but it has a compounding effect year after year that would be in addition to that potential. It is. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. So there are a few, I mean, and again, this budget that we're looking at right now, there are no cuts. There are a few retirements as far as A's or LTAs that after speaking with administrators, we don't need to fill going into next year. That's not a cut, that's just attrition. So, but there are no cuts. So we're one of the fortunate districts, I would say around here that are not cutting. I would say a lot of the larger districts, when you look at Rochester and you look at districts out of Albany, they're cutting 35 to 50 teachers, they're cutting program, there's, Back in 2008, they started talking, of course, it was sports, kindergarten, which is not mandated. And those things are back on the table with some of these districts. Yeah. So that's where they're talking a lot, what's left on the table, what, what was left on the table. Our average tax levy oh, since 2018 has been about 1.42%. And I also, I know the last meeting, just to kind of, we do this every year, if we were to go to a 1.75, how much do you have to cut out of the budget or take out of the budget or add more reserves to balance the budget? What would it cost? So every quarter percentage point is about $25,000. So to 2%, if you want to go to a 1% tax levy, either you're going to cut $100,000 in expenses or add $100,000 in revenues. And the only revenues that you can add at this point would be reserves. And not, again, not knowing the future of aid in subsequent years, I would recommend that we are very conservative with reserves and taking that approach. I mean, a lot of times you, and this gets a little shaky too, because as you add, as you build a budget like this and you're not cutting, we're adding new staff or new programs, we want to continue and maintain those, you usually never really see budgets drop. We saw it last year a little bit, just it was a very small amount, I think it was less than half, less than 0.1%, but a lot of that had to do, you saw a big increase, not a big increase, but a normal increase in contractual increases due to salaries and supplies and materials and fuel costs, but we got, we actually saw a reduction due to debt. Mm -hmm. So that fell off along with the revenue that comes from the state. So those are the only times you see that or their cuts. So I just want to give you a quick, we'll talk about this again. We have another budget session, I think on the first. April 8th. Eight? So real quick, if we were to see a full restoration in aid, I just wanted to show you real quick, how does that affect what was presented last week? This last week was more of a, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing an increase in taxes tentatively of 2%. State aid was a reduction of almost three. And then we saw a big, much bigger increase in reserves and fund balance to offset and balance that budget. Aid being fully restored, we're not looking to add any more to the budget as far as the expense side. We would just reduce the what we're relying on for reserves and fund balance. And then state aid, you would see a drop. So, so it's not like $370,000 comes back in and we say, all right, what do we want now? We're not, that's not what we're going for. We're just gonna rely less on those reserves 
save that money again for yep. the next three to four years if they start going back to that and dropping that word harmless. I think we presented this a couple times. These are neighboring districts. We, I just had a meeting two weeks ago. We went through the numbers again. There are quite a few districts that their tax caps above 2%, but they're staying at 2%. Or actually, one of them being tenant, we're just putting that out. Some districts are actually some of these. I just talked to another district yesterday, today. Um, there are a few districts that are actually looking to break the cap, not even go to cap, just keep breaking it. If nothing changes right. with state aid, they will need several districts will need to. Yeah, or cut. Correct. Cut their budgets. So the spending plans are on 22 and a half million, just a little shy of that. It's about an increase of about 937,000. Uh, percentage increase 4.35, and then we have a 2%. Uh, this tax cap limit should be 2.09. I apologize, but we're at 2% right now. That's what we built the budget on. One thing we have yet to do, like I said, fuel bids. We're working on what we will see as far as fund balance at the end of this year. There are certain items that we can look at and say, okay, we can take some of these textbooks or things out for the elementary, whether it be desks or, or items like that, pull that out of the budget if we need to get lower than that. So we still have that piece to work on. That's all I have for the budget. All right. Question? No? We have another question I was going to have. I answered it? He's, he's that good. Yeah. You are that good. Well good thing done. Brought him back. Well done. I wish I knew what it was. <laughs> we didn't talk about that really. What is Ro going to ask? Well, that could be anything. You know, it, all joking aside, we do. When we sit down and plan these together, we just try to wear different hats, yeah. through different lenses, and try to anticipate the questions, yeah. you know, that, that you'll have. So we did pretty good this time. Hopefully we'll have better news on the 8th, because the budget will come out by yes. the 1st, am I well, correct? Theoretically. Theoretically. <laughs> That's what happened. Yeah, so we'll see. Thanks, Kerry. Thank, yes. Thank you. And our superintendent's report. Uh, again, I, I get a kick out of being able to sit here and check things off my list as our principals uh, go through theirs. Oh, there's another one I can check. Yeah. Um, <laughs> last week we did talk about uh, workplace violence requirements mm -hmm. and the steps we need to take for the application of smart schools. We have held both of those committee meetings, actually the board meetings tonight. So we're uh, one more step closer to submitting that application for smart schools, which of course we're planning on applying toward all the upgrades in our safety and security systems throughout our campus. Um, once, uh, what will happen next is at the April 8th meeting, um, there will be a resolution of just basically saying, yes, we approve the use of smart schools funds to be applied in that way. Um, and then at that point, there's a 30 day uh, public notice that will just go on our website regarding that. After that 30 days is expired, then we can move forward with the application to the state to release those funds. Uh, which reminds me, April 8th, uh, is on our agenda as, or on our calendar as a budget workshop, but we have declared that a special meeting because the district superintendent, Michael Rulo from DCMO BOCES will be joining us to review the BOCES administrative budget before asking component districts to vote on that um, in the subsequent week. So April 8th will be a special meeting um, for that BOCES budget presentation and for another budget so workshop. Is there also a BOCES presentation on the 16th? No, on the 16th is the date across all component districts. We just vote on We have to vote oh, okay. all right. Right. Thank you. Um, for that budget. So he's doing his tour of districts and we wanted to get here before that. Um, that's all I have. Okay. So Kelly, with that smart yes. school funding, mm -hmm. that so the the items that we're going to get, like the cameras and all that stuff, are would be here when? Like, do we know? Like, when what would be the plan? This is going to be on a similar timeline to capital project, okay. and again, it will depend on when you know the okay. release of those funds get approved. But that was all part of the planning of the overall capital project, and smart schools was one of the funding sources that we had planned on for that component. 
that. Okay. They were here last week. You went all through, and yep. you've got a preliminary plan already. Okay. So they're moving. They're moving ahead. Okay. Um, the meeting on the eighth is that like a regular meeting for us? Start time five o'clock. Yes, right, Lisa. Okay. It's a five o'clock. I'm going to start with the budget workshop. Yeah. And then um, Michael Rule will be here at six o'clock for his presentation. I think that's for the back row and the. Uh, oh yeah, then they hit that again for future meetings, right? Yep. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, board committee reports. It was rather a light month. Mm -hmm. um, we had athletic committee and capital projects and facilities. Start with athletic. Yeah, sure. We um, discussed our um, upcoming opening for the athletic coordinator position. And uh, really the intent was to get an understanding of the real job description because that's been referred back to that committee to understand and evaluate options as they um, come forward. So um, what it comes down to, there's a number of different scenarios that we talked about that we'll continue to look at as we get more information. There's a few other pieces to fall into place that we're not sure about at this point. So it'll be a continual back and forth between uh, administration and the committee and we'll come back with recommendations. Thank you. Else nope, you did fine. Uh, capital project? We did meet. We talked about this fall flyer thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all we talked about. Right? It was. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the policy we have tomorrow. And these are getting mailed, I'm sorry, these are getting mailed out? Like in the mail? They, they arrived. Right. They came today. Some people okay. are receiving them all the time. I haven't been home yet. Then <laughs> <laughs> I did the introduction. Yeah. Nice. Now I appreciate everybody's feedback and participation. Yeah, I, did, I just read, when I read it over um, this time, it's it, I just think it's uh, a little more. Uh, I don't know what I want to say. Just more. Um, I don't know the word. Down Reader more. friendly. Reader friendly, thank you. It was more reader friendly, I thought. Okay. We have no policy review or adoptions for this month. And we have no old business. So we'll move right into new business. Need a motion, please, to approve the unit cost methodology for 2024 to 2025 OC services as submitted. So moved. So, second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion is carried. Motion, please, to adopt the academic calendar for 2024 through 2025. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I think it would be good for the public to hear about those two half days because I think parents might wonder about that also. So there are two half days that are on the calendar. They're denoted by little triangles. Uh, I don't have the calendar in front of me. At least I believe it's the 14th and 15th. Is that right? Thank you, Sean. 14th and 15th of November. Those are half days for parent teacher conferences. Um, the question was asked could we shift those to the two days prior to the Thanksgiving break, uh, with the concern that whenever there's a choppy week, sometimes we see a drop in student attendance. Um, those Half days for purpose of parent-teacher conference are considered differently in structure and in what is allowed under commissioner's regulations. So they, um, they can't occur in a week that is already truncated um, by a longer vacation. We know Thanksgiving week is Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday off. Um, also, we always schedule those teacher conferences to occur right at the end of the quarter. Oftentimes, our elementary students in particular will go home with the report cards on that day. Uh, and it's also a, a way to encourage parents to participate in those. And those are available K through 12. 
Those are the major things. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I need it. Yeah. Anybody else who has a question now? Great. Right. Right. Thanks, Lucy. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion's carried. And a motion, please, to change the previously adopted academic calendar to designate Monday, April 8th, 2024, Thursday, May 23rd, 2024, Friday, May 24th, 2024, and Tuesday, May 28th, 2024, as unused emergency days and dates the district will be closed. Should the district experience a need for an emergency closure that requires the use of an emergency day, they may be rescinded in the following order, May 23rd, April 8th, May 28th, and May 24th. So moved. Well, thank you. And a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? We'll just be sure now to fully communicate that to our families um, this week. Perfect. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is carried. A motion, please, to accept a donation from St. John's Episcopal Church in the amount of $87 for use in the backpack program. So moved. Warren and Kim, thank you. Second. Okay. Um, any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion is carried. A motion, please, to ratify the agreement between the Delaware Academy Superintendent and the Delaware Academy Faculty Association, dated July 1st, 2024, covering the period from July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2028, and authorize funding of these monies necessary to implement the provisions of the 2024-2027 collectively negotiated agreement. Thank you. And a second? Second. Any questions or comments? I'll just comment a bit, um, how much we appreciate the time and effort um, that everyone put into working at negotiating this agreement. Um, the process went um, really very, very smoothly, and it was. Um, it was, a, it was a good experience. It was a good experience for everyone. So thank you to everyone involved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion is carried. We'll move back to public comments. Board of Education welcomes comments and questions during this session, but will not respond to these comments or questions at this time. Items or issues you wish the board to consider for action or discussion may be placed on the board agenda by contacting the district clerk or superintendent one week prior to the board meeting. Do we have any public comments? Yes. Uh, yeah, can I know if you can, uh, can you discuss the increase uh, overall for the contract? The just over the course of the contract, was, it, was there a percentage increase over the <coughs> year for some amount? Can you discuss that? Um, we, we can probably handle that. Can we or not until it's... We can maybe contact them offline after the meeting. Okay. Uh, only because the full ratification has to go through first. Okay. okay. Yeah. But I can reach out to you, sir. Thank you. Is that it? Is it? Okay. Thank you. Well, for comments. I'll start. Okay. Well, we we'll see what's there. What, I'm sorry. Where are our comments? Yeah. Yes. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Show any distraction. Well, we usually go that way. No, it's okay. I just I was just, <laughs> I just um, start over there. really impressed <laughs> with the the reporting tonight with how, how many uh, programs are in the increase or just maybe it's always but it's just so nice to hear 
the partnerships between the middle or high school and the elementary school, the, you know, the, the cool educational things that the bigger kids are doing with the little kids or whatever. It's just, it, I, I love that stuff. And I'm just, I, it's so great. I just love it. it. It's great. They all love it. I mean, I've experienced it myself as a teacher doing things like that. And the big kids, it's, it's just great to see them in that environment. And the little kids just, just think they're also great to begin with. It's just, it's the, it's the best. I just love it. So thank you for, keep doing it. Do more. <laughs> Do more of that stuff. That's <laughs> really yeah. nice. Um, you know, for the many years, uh, volunteers I've been on this board, we've talked about the retirements, the wave of retirements that are coming, and I think we're seeing it manifest itself now. So, bittersweet. I wish you all the people retiring um, the best in their future endeavors. Um, thank you very much for the time that you spent here, the careers that you spent here mentoring and teaching our community and just want to express my gratitude really some really special people again mm -hmm. I, I echo that i mean really hard shoes to fill um, makes me nervous and and my children have had all of these teachers um i had mr rolf in high school and uh <laughs> When I walked in today and saw all of that artwork in the lobby, I was just so, it was so uplifting, blown away. So um, thank you. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of work to do to replace you all. Thank you. Uh, I echo the sentiments of Sean and, and Lauren. Um, we always, it's always a bittersweet. Uh, we look, we congratulate the retirees uh, we know there are great things out here uh, to do. Um, you might join the Board of Education. <laughs> but I do. And I highly it. recommend it. Yes. <laughs> um, I did go to the Old County uh, Conference. Uh, that was amazing. What was what I heard over and over uh, from the participants how much they enjoyed having somebody else take over and and seeing a different style and a different person, and it, uh, I think we, uh, we do such a great job with the arts in our school, as well as other programs. Um, as uh, bitter as it is to uh, see the retirees go and all the years they put in dedication, it makes me smile to see Molly coming uh, and other uh, good teachers uh, coming up. Uh, to fill in our uh, gaps, and I'm sure the ones who are retiring would be more than happy to help you too, um, as they always are. And uh, that's about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the congratulations, to like everyone has said, I, I really, you know, I, everything that's been said is spot on. Um, and I hope, you know, in hearing the the things that um, have been reported out, I think. You know, it reminds me that what makes our district special is so many of the extra things we do. I hope that the people that interview for these jobs, we can impress upon them the extra things that a lot of the people that are retiring have done over the years, going the extra mile, like the art show is a great example. Those things have to continue for us to continue to be special. So any way that we can communicate that those are that's part of the culture here um, i would support 100 percent because it really it is the fabric of the place and makes us who we are so uh, congratulations to everyone and welcome to our new family that's here um well <clears throat> i'd like to talk to my former colleagues for just a second <laughs> um so i would love to tell you how awesome retirement is i'll let you know when i find out <laughs> um, i haven't really retired <laughs> but i do want to congratulate you because um uh you, it is certainly well deserved um i when i see a list like this i i i look at it as how many years of experience are walking out the door and how much um uh, time and effort, sweat and tears sometimes of planning and instructing and so on and so forth. Um, you know, 
it's never a, a, a good time to be a new teacher. And I only say that because it's a lot of work when you're first starting out, if you're doing it correctly. And, um, uh, but, when, but when I see people like Molly sitting there, <laughs> I'm very, very excited. She's one of my former sixth graders. And um, I love the fact that you've sort of come home um, to, to give your career. So, so retirees, congratulations. I hope you really do retire. That would be awesome. Um, and Molly picked a great place to work. And you know that though, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a great answer. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also like to thank the teachers that I've had over the years and for um, the great experiences that I've had with them. Um, they'll be so surely missed. Um, and I think I'd like to say Happy Easter to everyone who celebrates, because that's the Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, and other than that, I have nothing else. Yes, thank you. Um, we do have a few upcoming meetings that I'll make everyone aware of. Our Board of Education special meeting and budget workshop is Monday, April 8th beginning at 5 p.m. in the High School Media Library Center. There will be a budget workshop presentation to be followed by a presentation of the DCMO BOCES budget by Michael Rulo, DCMO BOCES District Superintendent. We have a special school district meeting and election. There will be a special school district meeting and election held on Tuesday, April 16th in the lobby of the Middle School Gymnasium. Polls will be kept open between 12 noon and 8 p.m. Any current resident who has lived in our school district boundaries for at least 30 days and is at least 18 years of age is eligible to vote with proper identification. Absentee ballots can be requested by calling the district clerk's office at 607-746-1306. The district clerk must receive applications for absentee ballots at least seven days prior to the vote if the ballot is to be mailed to the voter or on or prior to April 15th. 2024, the day before the vote, if the ballot is to be issued to the voter in person. The district clerk must re receive absentee ballots at said office not later than 5 p.m. on April 16, 2024. That day is also a very busy day. Our regular Board of Education meeting to coincide with DC Mobosi's annual meeting is Tuesday, April 16, 2024, in the High School Media Library Center at 5 p.m. It's anticipated the board will convene an executive session at 5 p.m. and return to open session at 6 p.m. The deadline for items to be placed on the board agenda is the Tuesday prior to each Board of Education meeting. If you have any questions, please contact the district clerk at 607-746-1306. And finally, while this is not a Board of Education meeting, there will be a public forum for the capital project held on Wednesday, April 9th, 2024 at 6 p.m. in the High School Library Media Center. This will include a presentation on the product and a project and a forum for questions and answers. Okay, you said Wednesday, April 9th. I think it's Tuesday, April 9th. It should be Tuesday, April 9th. That is correct. Okay. Yes, Tuesday, April 9th. And one more piece of clarification. Uh, this board approved an amendment to the current school year calendar that gives off Monday, April 8th uh, for students. That's also the day of the solar eclipse. We will hold the board meeting that evening. So although there's no school, we still will have the budget workshop and a presentation by Nick Lula. And we are not having a second executive session. So at this point, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Dash, could you watch the live stream please?